I'm David Glenn Taylor, and this is the Voyagers Podcast. Let's talk about storytelling. I've been reflecting on this first season of the podcast, about the stories I've heard from all these amazing people and the incredible gift they bring to their circles of influence. It's through storytelling that they've brought these gifts to the rest of us, the listeners. In this way, the storyteller has the power to inspire, uplift, encourage, enlighten, just as a storyteller has the power to terrify, sadden, leave us grieving over loss. I haven't had those kind of storytellers on my podcast. Maybe season two? Yeah, we'll see. It's been this way since the first humans learned to communicate with one another. Story is the medium that drives human evolution. So today, on this penultimate episode of Season 1 of The Voyagers, I want to introduce you to a friend named Stefan Schaefer. Stefan and I got to know each other while coaching our son's basketball team a few seasons ago. Steph makes movies, and I just think that's the coolest storytelling job out there. Last year, I had the pleasure of hanging out on the set of his new film, Aloha Surf Hotel, which recently premiered at the Hawaii International Film Festival in Honolulu. I even got to be an extra. I think my shoulder actually made it into the movie, which officially marks my cinematic debut. Ever since we met, I've been dying to sit down and just pick his brain on the art of putting together a movie. And we finally made it happen. Most people don't know how crazy and difficult it is to actually make a movie of any kind, of any budget. You're at the tail end. You just you just finished. It's done, yeah. Well, it, I guess it's never really done right. until you actually <laughs> deliver it. Yeah, and then it's in someone else's hands. So is it delivered? Amazon. Well, it's delivered to the film festival. It is so good. that that cut is going to screen. It's done on Thursday. And how are you feeling about it? I think it, I mean I'm feeling all right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean this is the thing about art and yeah. film. Yeah. Is that you know you have a set of parameters and you work within the those. Yeah you know, that framework. And this, like all films, had, you know, budgetary framework, scheduled framework. You know, it evolved out of another pitch. Yeah. I had pitched it as a, as a TV series. Oh, did you really? Is the script been finished for years? Did you write this like years ago? Is this like a James Cameron thing where you like wrote it and then put it in a drawer? So probably six years ago, our friends John and Joanne were out here from LA. And John is a big producer in comedy world. And he produced my first film in New York in 2004. And we were just sort of pitching around different ideas. And I had always thought sort of low-hanging fruit here in Hawaii would be like this washed-up surf pro. Who, you know, we spend a fair amount of time at Hokipa. And, you know, and I look around at these characters. And many of them are living vicariously through their kids, hoping their kids will be professional surfers. (laughs) And they weren't, right? (laughs) Right. But a lot of them are very sort of eccentric colorful characters. So I thought, this is an interesting sort of world. And so when John was out here, we were kicking around this idea that maybe there could be a, you know, a show about a washed up surf pro has to teach obnoxious tourists how to surf. And there's a bit of a show engine there. And then you place it within a, you know, like a family run hotel. So it seemed he's in the, like he does, you know, Wet Hot American Summer and Mm -hmm. on Netflix. And he did this show Children's Hospital, which was on Adult Swim and HBO. Anyway, he's done a lot of these short form comedies, both web series and conventional TV shows. And so I heard that there was this fund on the Big Island to support local media projects. So I went over there and I pitched it as a TV show. Right. And I got a little seed money and we shot like a presentation pilot as a show. Yeah. And um, we almost set it up on a couple of digital platforms and then it kind of went dormant and um, we all got busy with other projects. Yeah. And then the fund called back and said, our money's getting reallocated. What about doing it as a feature film? Yeah. And so, was it called Aloha Surf Hotel at the time? Did you, was that it was called name? Surf Break Hotel. Surf Break Hotel. Yeah. Yeah. So they said, we have some money. If you can match it with investor money, we'll, we'll match you. Oh, nice. And, you know, I knew what the overall budget parameters were, and I was like, do I want to do this? It's not, a, it's not that much, but <laughs> yeah. it's also hard to walk away from money, yeah. especially if you've invested time into a concept and an idea. Yeah, and so yeah. I ended up, you know, finding three investors that would match and the fund matched and you know we pulled this together and then I, I sort of took what we had as a season arc yeah. for the show and I you know wrote it into a fe- in 90 you know 93 minute feature film I've been working on a script I know everybody is but I too have been working on a script 
and and so I'm but I'm learning like the basics. Oh, you got to use a courier font, and you got to do all this kind of stuff. Like, yeah, how long did it take you to write? I mean, from start to finish, in terms of what you sit down and write a 93 minute, and that's what a hundred page script, 110. I mean, typically it's a page a minute. Is okay. the goal. So 93 it was minutes, 90, yeah, it was somewhere 93 pages in that range. Yeah. How long did it take you? It was pretty quick, actually. I don't know exactly, but probably I got a draft out in, you know, six weeks, eight weeks. Holy cow. Something like that. But, but you know, then you're refining it constantly course, and you're yeah. thinking about casting it and then you're rewriting it. I mean, a lot of it is the rewriting, honestly. Yeah. You, there was one time, I, I wrote a full feature script in 10 days once. No I'm kidding. <laughs> because, uh, yeah, it was, it was a paid job. And I was writing with a partner, but I, the, my the deal was like I write the first draft, then you take it and do the second draft, and yeah. then we bounce it back and forth. But that you know, so it was like ten pages a day. Yeah. Just, but is it high quality? Who knows? Right, Who knows? Right, you right. know. Right. So, I mean, I love when you get into the groove and you're like writing yeah. five pages a day somewhere in there for a couple of weeks, and yeah. you really can. Then you're just living. You're is living that the in that thing world. you love the most? Writing is that the thing? I. Or is it like, do you like, would you rather just kind of, you want to be on the set? I mean, what's the thing that really kind of attracts you to being a filmmaker? I came into the industry, I guess, through writing. And I do, there's a purity in the writing. Right. I mean, if you, you know, it, it's it's a craft and it's pain in the ass and it's difficult to yeah. get yourself to sit down and just push through the barriers yeah. that you set, yeah. <laughs> set up in front of yourself. But, yeah. um... But yeah, no, I, I love the purity of the writing. And then I, I guess, you know, walking on set that first day is pretty thrilling too. Yeah. This this one you shot, I mean, you said in six weeks, right? The whole film? We shot it in under three weeks. I mean, we the shot it. The whole movie. Yeah, yeah. The whole, I mean, the, that's the thing though. I'm, with this budget level, this is what I was talking about with the parameters. It's like, you know, it's pretty straightforward in terms of, okay, number of days, overall budget. Sure. You know, Screen Actors Guild contract pegs, a, you know. Right. a day rate to to the actor's fee and then once you know that you say okay well we have to simplify it you know i wanted to have a nice helicopter shot or a drone shot and i wanted to have a big you know whatever it is and you say how can i tell the same story beat in something that's simpler right. um, and less expensive right and there's always a way to do it i mean even if you're doing a hundred million dollar movie you're you're still i'm sure there you i mean i've done bigger i've done films in the you know, over a million dollar range, five million dollars. You still have there's still things you may hope you could do that you can't do, or you can't right. cast the right the the person that you really want to because they want to get paid. How do you know, X amount? Well, that was kind of the thing is I when I got to go on set for a day, it was fun. I had a great time. I got to be a body double, which which I didn't. I just you were like, hey, come on down. And I'm like, okay, I'll go check it out. And it was fun. It was a ton of fun. How do you get in a space where you're actually artistically focused? versus budget focused, you know, because it has to be that every time you go cut, let's do that one again. Are you then, is this part of your brain going, we're hitting overtime or we're doing this, we got to make sure that, you know, is it? Well, I mean, it depends on the project and who's in your constellation right. people. So on a, on a bigger film, I would say there's often a tension between the director who doesn't give a shit. About yeah. It. You can swear. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. So <laughs> on, on bigger films. Yeah. I think there's often this tension where the, everyone around the director is basically trying to put all the pieces in place so that so they can really just focus what's on the monitor right. and work with the actors and or the you know cinematographer. Right. The director may just keep doing another take or another setup until the producer whispers in you know his or her ear and says you know you can't do this. But you also have a you know an AD assistant director who has the daily schedule right. and so they're trying to keep things going. Yeah. But, you know, on a huge film, you may do a page and a half a day. On a film like this, you know, we were doing seven to ten pages a day. So you just, you, you simply don't have the same amount of time. Wow. Which makes you have to work harder in pre-production so that you know that everything is, you know, going to run as smoothly as it possibly yeah. can. I mean, this actors are learning their lines. That's the whole, I mean, I, I'm assuming they receive the scripts ahead of time or whatever. They can start memorizing lines and stuff like that. But they're getting on, if you're doing ten pages in a day... You you do have a point where you're going. I I can't work with the, I I this is good enough. Is that okay? So this just question, and I'm not talking about your movie, but I'm talking about movies in general. Is that how bad movies end up being made? I took a workshop with Stephen Frears at the Berlin Film Festival when I was, you know, in my twenties, and he basically said like ninety five percent of your film is a good script and acting, making sure the script is in great shape right. and that you cast it well. 
yeah. be, you know, and he, he would talk about, uh, I think he was talking about like dangerous liaison or something like where he would show up on set and kind of look around like, I'm not sure I'm worthy of, I don't know what I'm doing here. You know, like you, you have these incredible <laughs> actors and yeah. all these amazing technicians yeah, and a great script. Yeah. And then it's kind of like on autopilot. I mean, sure. you know, you actually don't have to do that much. And I've right. experienced that with like amazing actors where even in, in an audition, you know, they're reading your, your lines and you're like, I didn't even realize, like, I didn't realize that they could have this take on it and yeah. it takes it to another whole level yeah. or yeah. it's just awful and you need, you know, you need to rewrite it, you know, but I spend most of my time as a screenwriter. So I definitely have a bias around, you know, really working it through on the, the screen yeah. level. Yeah. So I think bad films typically are a function of bad scripts and poor casting. And I've experienced that. I've had to force, I, I was forced to cast someone in my first movie who this actor was at a pretty high level and the producers assured me that casting this person would make us be able to sell the movie and it'd be great for everyone's career and all this. And right. it was the wrong choice. Yeah. It definitely impacted the film and, and it, it didn't jive with my vision of it. And I mean, there were many other issues with that movie, but yeah. that was one of them, I think. Sure. Hey, let's talk about actors for a second. We get some actors out on the on the boat, you know. We get them. We get. Yeah. I've met. I've met a bunch of them. They tend to be a kind of an eccentric bunch and and kind of interesting and odd. Met some really nice ones, you know. Met some kind of really odd ones. When you're casting an actor, is it like you're you're recruiting for a baseball team in which you're, the character of the person matters, or are you just purely looking at their resume and their film resume and and the work that they've done? Well, I would say it's a, it's a bit of both. There are actors that come in with a reputation, you know, but you may just love what you've seen of their body of work. And yeah. so you, you're willing to take that on or you think that you can somehow create a different dynamic with them. Right. I've had a few sort of challenging characters. Most of the time they're pretty insecure and they right. want, they want, need their ego to be... Why do you think that Stress. is? Because that's the thing. Everybody... I mean, it's incredible. It's involved. It's vulnerable. I mean, right. you, you, as an actor, you're coming in. You don't have control. You have control over your performance. But there are so many other variables in a film. I mean, there are literally hundreds of other inputs. So you could give a great performance. Yeah. But, you know, your co-star could just stink it up. Or, this, you know, the sound person could screw up the sound. And you'd have to do ADR. I mean, there, there, there's so many, you know, there are directors who don't give up the whole script, you know, mm -hmm. so that, you know, you're, you're sending specific sides to an actor. They're coming on set. Unlike theater where you experience the arc of a story in right. one performance, right. you know, it's, it's a much, oftentimes a much more disjointed experience for them where they're coming in, they're shooting minute three of the movie one day, the next minute they're shooting the final scene, then they're shooting something in the middle. And mm -hmm. for them to keep track of where they are emotionally or psychologically is a lot. Right. I did a whole project with quite a few members of the cast of Sopranos, and they just come off this massive HBO hit, right? Yeah. So then yeah. we're going into doing an indie movie directed by Michael Imperioli. I was producing it. You know, then you're trying to manage, okay, you're used to having your own private space, but here we are shooting indie at two in the morning on the streets in New York, right. and, you know, we have a we have an SUV you can sit in, or, you, you know, so... <laughs> <laughs> It's it's managing expectations. I'll be in my trainer. Yeah, no, there's I no trailer. Like, <laughs> like no I want a half banger, and I want to. I've experienced this a lot too. Where so one one of our actors in this movie, <clears throat> I hear okay, so she, through a friend, the script gets to her. She wants to do it. Then I get on the call with her manager, and he's like, "Well, she's fifty thousand dollars a week." And I said, "Well, I mean, that's great, but that's not what this project is. So if yeah. she wants to do it, it has to be something else." And yeah. you know, then it's like, "Well, you know, first class and certain hotel." And then, you know, so, you, you know, oftentimes the actor is drawn to a project because they love the content or they think they're going to stretch sure. a muscle or they're doing something new right. or they're being cast outside of what the world expects of them. Sure. But then you have their whole management team that you, you know, that mm. it basically, first of all, they make 10% or 15 yeah, whatever the so. percentage is. So they want to keep the precedent at the same level or moving up. Right. So there's, there's all sorts of sort of tensions and conflicts and negotiations before you actually get to the first day yeah. of calling action. Well, I don't know. I mean, I think part of what... I studied acting and acted Oh, did you my really? Whole, okay, whole... You know what? Actually, I, did, I saw a trailer for one of your films and you were, act, you were acting in the film. You were wearing like a white suit and so I haven't seen the film yet. Is that... Oh, Kuleana. Kuleana. I haven't actually watched it yet. I gotta... That's mixed yeah. up, man. So I always feel pretty confident and comfortable working with the actors. Mm -hmm. Like that's a... You know, and when I started in film, I had less experience, I guess, with the visual language of film as opposed to the 
you know, dramatic language of film. And so I always felt really comfortable working with actors, but hadn't really worked out how to talk to the crew or the cinematographer, or figure out how you, how to tell a story in a visual way as opposed mm-hmm. to a plot-driven and or, you know, dialogue. Both your kids want to be actors. They both talk about it. And I think, you know, I mean, who knows? They're, you know, 16 and 13. So they've been on set quite a few times right. at this point, and they've been in films. And it's a thrilling, it's an exciting world, you know? Yeah. To visit, mm-hmm. so I don't know. I mean, we'll see what they want to do. How did you end up on Maui? I mean, because New York, Maui, New York, L.A., Maui. Right. We have a lot of movie stars that live out here. I mean, my wife Chenta grew up in Hawaii, and uh, we were living in New York. And her mom was out here. They grew up here, then they lived on the mainland. Her mom, when they all went to college, moved back, and she was living here, and she passed away suddenly. And so we moved out here for a year just to see if we could, you know, hold on to the property and to sort of go through this whole process because she, it was really out of the blue. We moved out, our kids were two and a half and five, and we were moving out from, you know, New York City, Brooklyn. And after a year, we were like, you know, it just feels like we got here. It it seems like (laughs) we just got here, we were going to extend it, and then we kept extending it because, you know, it's a, I think from a family perspective, it's a great place. And both she and I grew up in play. So she grew up here. I grew up in England until I was 11, where nature was just, you know, a huge part of my world and consciousness and subconscious, all of it, just spending time outdoors. And so I think both of us, you know, once we were here, realized the importance of that ocean and how prominent the beauty of the island is in our daily lives. And just career-wise, I mean, in some, you know, I had a whole I had a production company in New York. I, I still have a partner in New York. And, you know, I was very much in the... New York indie film world. But then when I, we moved here, I ended up getting an agent and a manager in LA. And right. So oddly, like moving here sort of opened LA up to me because I had always sort of had a defiant FU attitude towards the <laughs> commercial sellouts. But as I aged and moved here, I was like, you know what? There are a lot of smart people there doing really interesting content. And right. Yeah, that kind of, that whole kind of sellout idea, it kind of starts to fade away when you get a little older and you have kids and then you need to pay bills and I don't know, a little bit. Yeah. Well, and also I think, I mean, it's just a shift in storytelling and I mean, there's amazing TV happening now, right? So a lot of the people I knew in New York who were really in that indie film scene have, you know, if they're still in it, there, many of them are in LA and they're working on, you know, long form, they're working on TV shows where there's a lot of amazing storytelling happening. That idea you were talking about in, in Aloha, that became a Law Surf Hotel, yeah. that would have been an awesome little TV. There are so many characters. You, you even done a whole keep of this for sure. You know, yeah. like just thinking about how that the island has these very concentrated little neighborhoods full of quirky, interesting people. You know. Well, you know, I mean, since being here, I've sold three TV shows. They just haven't gone into production. So I, I sold a show to Sony that you know went through development and didn't get produced. Then I. I sold a show I really loved, still would love to make happen to the Weinstein Company. And then, you know, Harvey <laughs> got bust, you know, and so that's... He but, Weinsteined himself. Yeah. But that's, you know, that's a 1820s Hawaii show. 1820s? So, yeah, it's it's, it's right at the end of uh, Kamehameha. Kahumanu sort of steps into the power vacuum. She's this amazing queen. And it's the decade when the missionaries are coming. And Hawaii is sort of this geopolitically important place. Yeah. And, oh yeah, you know you have the fur trade and the opium trade from China. You have the Russians here, the French here, the British here, right? And the Hawaiian monarchy is shifting. It's you know I love that that oh, decade. Oh yeah, and the whole transition from the Hawaiian you know mythology and belief, religion to yeah. Christianity. Yeah, breaking kapu. I mean, she becomes yeah. you know she converts to Christianity. Yeah. So you know that was the show, and I wrote it with this a friend of mine, Paha, you know who's. Hawaiian and speaks Hawaiian fluently and is, you know, steeped in the history. You know, they were beginning to cast. They were all excited about it, but, yeah. you know, that sort of imploded. But he's now working with um, Jason Momoa, and they have a show that actually starts a decade earlier. And so potentially, if, if that goes into production, then I would write with him on season two, right. which would be the world that we were exploring. So anyway, yeah, I, I would love to be in a writing room on a TV show. Yeah. Wow. And then I... then. You know, two years ago, or two and a half years ago, we sold contemporary Hawaiian drama to AMC. Oh, no kidding. And went through like a whole year and a half development. You know, it was well paid. It was, you know, executives loved us. It was seemed really good. And um, 
that was with a production company, Big Beach, which did like Little Miss Sunshine and a lot of great movies, but it was AMC and Big Beach. And then a new executive came in at AMC and like, and he says, got that. Yeah. So isn't that the way of it? So that, <laughs> so, you know, so in the last 11 years of being in Hawaii, I've sold three shows through my managers in LA and have been paid well for those things. But then I've always had other indie projects. Otherwise it's just crushing. Yeah. It's crushing. Right. You know, cause I invested a lot of love and work yeah. in those projects yeah. and I still see them as totally viable yeah. shows. It's just that, you know, you sign those contracts and it's, you know, you give up the right to figuring out the destiny of that project. I, well, I'm into, I came out of the graphic design world, right? So I understand what it is to like work a ton on something and then watch the whole thing just go away. At my first film, we um, had a test screening at a screening room in Soho and I was, you know, we knew that there were problems with, with the movie. But rather than have people fill out forms before they say anything, like, okay, 10 questions, you know, check, what did you like, didn't like, one of the producers just stood up afterwards and started asking questions. And, yeah. and then the first, you know, whoever speaks first, yeah. it just creates a whole nother dynamic and people either agree with that person or don't and just spun out. I remember watching a documentary called Art and Copy. You ever see that film? Mm -hmm. I think it's still on Netflix. You can find it in different places, but it, it was uh, 2006. It was uh, about advertising, about the advertising industry and kind of the development of the ad, in ad industry kind of from the Golden Age, Park Avenue Golden Age, 19, early 60s, kind of up till that modern, the, the mid 2000s and when they were doing that. So kind of talking about some of the iconic ad campaigns and what, what those campaigns that really kind of kicked things forward in the film, they, they, at one point, there's a, these two guys that were, were on this very famous ad agency. They were responsible for the Got Milk campaign and some of these other kind of famous campaigns. And one of the partners was a bit of a hard nose. The other guy said, you know, we work really, really hard around here to create an extremely nurturing environment. Everything from lighting to catering in the, you know, the break room, uh, the, our op the offices of our designers and our directors and the people that work. He says, we create that environment because... We know going in that you've got young people and 99.9% .9 of the work they do ends up on the floor. And like you were talking about, like it seems like you would have to go into these, these knowing that you have to give yourself kind of a nurturing environment. Right, like what you're saying, I gotta have these indie projects over here to take care of my soul, right? Where I have the creative freedom to, to do the thing that I need to do. So is that like a purposeful, conscious maintenance thing that you do on your part? And when did you figure that out? Yeah, I mean, so early on, it was sort of, you know, you put all your eggs in one basket, yeah. you know. So early on, I would have one script that I would labor on and work and really love. And then I would send it out in the world. And if there was interest, you know, then you get into negotiations or sell it. Or I think it was, I had a project that basically was funded. We were going out to Laura Linney the next day. And overnight, there was something in the trades that there was another very similar film just going into production. So they beat us to the punch. You know, it just killed it. Like literally overnight. You know, it was like, okay, well, it doesn't make any sense. You know, it doesn't make any sense to, mm -hmm. to do this. It, it was early, and I, I thought, okay, this maybe is the big break, you know, whatever, the, the quote-unquote big break. But at that point, I realized I can't only have one project that's out there. I need to have multiple projects that are in development at any one point because you just don't know which one's going to go. Yeah. And so now I always have like four or five or six projects that are in various stages of potential. That's something I, I learned from that experience. Also, as you develop as an artist, you have more projects that you've been working on and or pitches that people have responded to. So, you know, some are in treatment form, some are finished scripts, right. some you'd like to refashion. You know, maybe it was a feature script and you think, well, this could be still good. Now in this new TV landscape, maybe it's an interesting TV pitch. So now I always have more than one project at any one time. And people always say like, isn't that, don't you feel schizophrenic doing that? <laughs> yeah. But it's usually that I'm working on one thing for a week or a day. Like I'm focused on one. I'm trying not within one day. I'm trying, I'm usually not sort of jumping back and forth between yeah. projects. Although in this case right now, you know, sort of delivering it and the release of one project is dovetailing with finishing editing a documentary and potentially shooting another project next month. So you know, so all in, you're like in all kind of. F you're over here. You're writing over here. You're directing over here. You're editing. You you you're taking on everything. You're kind of Jeff Paul Trace guy. Just a dilettante, you know. Yeah. To, um. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I guess I'm the, sort of going back to the writing. That's 
I feel most comfortable in the in the screenwriting universe. Yeah. I'm actually taking a horror cinema class right now. Are you really? It's a hole in my my film. Uh, you want to yeah. make a horror movie? Well, no. Do you like horror movies? Are you uh, a fan no, of I never. That's why. That's why I'm taking the course because I I never have been a big horror fan. But there's a lot to learn from the genre. And I have actually written two horror scripts along the, over the years, but I just thought it was gonna, you know be interesting to take it. I, okay, horror movies. Mm -hmm. Like, why? Why do we? I hate horror movies. Mm -hmm. Like, I won't watch them because mm -hmm. I just don't want to be scared. Yeah, I don't like it. I don't enjoy the sensation of being terrified yeah. or being horrified by watching someone brutally murder or yeah. something like that. Like, what is it? Why do we, as a human? race do that i don't know I, it's never been a genre that i'm attracted to although i think the psychological thriller yeah okay like, that's different right what's been good about this course is it's forced me to watch films that i absolutely never would have watched like what movie well i mean just historically you know the fly like both of the flies oh, wow. i've never watched those yeah. um i mean we we started the, the course started with watching like the first frankenstein okay you know edison's sure. frankenstein sure, and, sure. and it's sort of progressing chronologically Films like, you know, The Shining or Silence of the Lambs. I mean, th those would fall into the ge general genre. Yeah. And that's, you know, great script, great acting, psychological tension and, and right. horror and scare. Yeah. And that I can get into. I, the slasher. Yeah. The slasher stuff blood, I can't do. Yeah. Extraneous violence. What's interesting to me is, like, the majority of the people in the class are women. The biggest audience segment is women. Really? Yeah. This is what the professor is telling me. And, I mean, totally anecdotally in this class, it seems to bear out. Like, these people are full-on horror nerds. They know, I mean, they make references back to the classics, and then they, they see all the new stuff that comes out. And I mean, like, <laughs> yeah. you know, a film like Get Out. Did you see Get Out? I did not. I mean, so to me, that's scary. I, that's very scary. Right. But it's interesting social commentary. Yes, and I would, I would, I should have, and I kept telling myself, I'm going to watch it on an airplane. Yeah, little little screen, yeah, yeah. lots of people around yeah. me. Yeah, cool. But I, I never got around to it. So. No, I have to watch. I have to watch these movies for class in the middle of the day. By you know, yeah. I mean, I like to you know sometimes there'll be a pet some something because I, I can't handle. It. I get too nervous. <laughs> yeah, and especially like jump scares or yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. And it, I, it's obviously a, it's a huge genre and. And I do think at the core of any horror movie is like, you know, what is the fear? You know, what's the fear that any of these films are dealing with? And that's, you know, we watched The Omen. That's a pretty interesting movie. I had never seen it because I would have never gravitated towards it. I mean, people like to, I guess, why? experience the fight or flight. You, I really do want to understand it, but yeah. I don't get it. I don't, I mean, that's partly why I took the class because I feel the same way. It stresses me out to know that something's coming that's you yeah. know i can't anticipate i mean obviously the genre is pretty broad so you have films that are built around just shock value and scare yeah. versus the slow psychological moment i don't know i mean it's obviously it's a huge genre yeah. and and just in terms of films there have been so many cases of low but you know Blair Witch Project, for example. I mean, like, in terms of return on investment, like, very low-budget horror movies that have yeah. done extremely well. Right. And and so I think it is oftentimes a place where, like, indie filmmakers get into it. Right. And, and you know, the bar is relatively low in terms of production value sometimes. Right. And, you know, audiences, sure. you know, if, if it's a, com a horror comedy, you know, it just clearly it, it taps into <laughs> something deep. And Something psychological and, and universal. I mean, it's, right. it's a huge honor. What are you looking forward to right now, man? What's the thing that you're kind of seeing in the future and you're going, this is, I can't wait to do it. For me, it's a vacation. <laughs> I don't know about you, man. I recently have been writing a project that is sort of, I mean, it all started because we were watching the Zeffirelli version of Romeo and Juliet with the kids. Oh, for nice. earlier yeah. in the pandemic and uh you know i just i thought oh, turns out you know shakespeare was on to something like you know looking yeah. at class difference i mean it, it's not so much class difference in that but i, I just started make, made me think about like within a universe such as hawaii or maui all the different demographics and subcultures and you know obviously a big one here is people who are transplants versus local what that looks like and how that dovetails with you know race, class, language. Yeah. 
And so one of the projects I'm working on is sort of exploring that. I don't know if you've seen any of the normal people that, mm. uh, it's a TV show on Hulu, okay. and it's it's basically about two high school kids in their senior year. One is you know working class, and one is wealthy, and but they're both sort of smart kids in the school. Right. And um, in fact, the, the mom of the one of the boy is a cleaning woman at the, oh, the upper class house. Okay. It was based on a book. Anyway, <clears throat> that got me thinking about oh yeah, to create a story that involves romance across class, race, set in Hawaii is interesting to me. Yeah, and. You know, and part of it is trying to explore and figure out what the hell's going on in the bigger macro dialogue about right. life and identity and how we all navigate it. Because clearly, the longer I live here, I mean, it, it's, you know, our kids are in the same school. We, there's so many different worlds. And, like, what does it mean to be rooted to a place? Yeah. Something that I feel, because my family's from multiple different places, I've lived all over the world. I don't feel rooted to a piece of land or place or even one national origin that's predominant. Right. That's a totally different experience than growing up in k as a Hawaiian or growing up as a... In Nupiak in Alaska. Yeah. You go up there and they're like 10,000 years, or feet they've been there. Yeah. And the North Slope. Yeah. You know, and you feel that when you're there. I remember because you know, you're not only. I remember I spent a lot of time in Barrow up in the Arctic and up on the right on the ocean there. And you chat with people. About four thousand people live in the town, mostly Alaska Native, mostly Inupiaq people. And and I remember a friend of mine talking with her, and she she felt she was. Just, I remember she. I, this is my home. I feel so at home here, and just this is my home. And it was when she would say that I I I had a, there was a bit of jealousy on my part, and that yeah. I was like, wow. Like, that is when she says that she's she's describing something ancient, and I can't do that. Yep. You know what I mean? And I, I I remember feeling that for sure. Yeah. So that's something I wrote. I was thinking of it as a standalone feature, but in the new TV landscape, I was talking to my manager and I adapted it into a pilot now. But I I would like to do a, you know, it would be great to do a show or a feature that sort of explores that. Yeah. Uh, Dude, complexity I love that. I love that. through, but with romance, like yeah. you know, you, using the age-old formula yeah i've been doing that you know going back to scotland for me you know to my mother's side of the family um well, my mother's dad that has been a big thing for me i felt um it was the first time in my life that i've been somewhere that i started to just started to feel i guess you could you could say the peripheral blend you know when you're when you're rooted in a place all the stuff in the periphery makes sense you know what i mean it's the stuff it easily melds with your subconscious and you don't have to think very much and that's what I noticed in, in Barrow in the, in the villages and stuff like that where I'm sitting here looking out over this vast tundra and stuff like that they're not processing that they don't process any of this stuff because they've been here for 10,000 years you know they're, they're focused on what's in front of them the subconscious the peripheral is all just relaxed you know and I I experienced that in Scotland that's why we started going back a lot and just hanging out there I love it there but I mean that's interesting because yeah. you're saying okay I mean, in some ways, you're like prioritizing one part of your yeah. your lineage. And I had to I had to grasp that. What I had to do is I had to come to a place where I was feeling, and I'm naturally feeling where my heart is bending. Yeah. Right. And I felt this tie, and I felt that for many years. This this pull towards Scotland, mm -hmm. whereas like my mom's mom uh, was Danish, and I've had no curiosity about. It. It at all, mm -hmm. which has been weird for me mm -hmm. to go. Like I'm not even the slightest bit curious about Denmark, and I'm sure it's lovely, and I would love to go, right? Yeah, I've never been. Yeah, never cared to go, never even thought about going, yeah. and I don't know why that is. I really don't. I have no clue why that is because I certainly liked my grandma more than I liked my grandfather, mm -hmm. but for some reason my heart bends in that direction. Yeah. Um, on my dad's side, my dad, I, I just we just found out through the whole 23 me because he was adopted, and we didn't know we had no history of his of his actual blood family. Just found out that that um, he again back mostly from the UK, almost all of it from England and Scotland. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, so the vast majority of me is coming from that island, mm -hmm. you know that, and um, and so I feel that, and I and I, I I was feeling that bend towards Scotland before even that took place, mm -hmm. you know, and so going back there has been a humble thing in that I'm not going back there going, hey boys, we're Scottish, you know what I mean? Not that at all. Right. I'm going back there and I'm learning and I'm feeling, but I'd spend a lot of time just feeling that space, you know? Mm -hmm. So, because I've spent a lot of time in Indian country and the Navajo Nation and in the Arctic and Alaska Native villages and now here in Hawaii, 
And I've always, just like you, I've always been watching and going and watching these people that are rooted in these places that have been upended in so many ways Mm -hmm. and just, yeah, envious a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, and I do think that that it could play into our prior discussion about the politics and identity is Mm -hmm. like, you know, seemingly much more focus on identity politics. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. when all these different groups are identifying, you know, where does that leave the you know, Caucasian middle Midwestern person with, yeah. you know, multiple lineages. Yeah. And I mean, the, the German history is complicated because, yeah, it's super you know, complicated. you know, I, I yeah. grew up mainly in New York and, you know, my friend, Michael Berkowitz, we'd be playing basketball and, you know, if I scored on him or he scored on me, he'd be like, yeah, but don't forget what your grandparents did to my grandparents. Oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> so it was like you know, that, ex- you know, with the name that I have, Stefan Schaefer is very German. Yeah. You know, it was definitely front and center. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, I also, I'm Swedish and Scottish and Italian. Yeah. So. Fascinating, man. Yeah. Well, dude, I, I, we did it. We did it. We did it. We did the Voyagers podcast. All right. The Voyagers podcast is produced by Sugar Sled Productions and recorded in Kula on the island of Maui. It's hosted by me, David Glenn Taylor. A huge mahalo nui to staff for coming on. You'll want to check out Aloha Surf Hotel. The Hawaii International Film Festival runs until November 29th, and with an all-access pass, you can watch it right now at HIFF.org. Or, if film festivals aren't your thing, follow at Aloha Surf Hotel on Instagram. And when it hits streaming, you'll be the first to know. If you enjoyed what you heard, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening. It helps me grow the audience, keeps the conversations going, and if you're interested in becoming a sponsor or in supporting the podcast, you can go to VoyagersPodcast.com and click the link to become a Patreon supporter. And if you want to sponsor, just shoot me an email, david at VoyagersPodcast.com. Next week on the final episode of Season 1, the boys of the Doomed Whiskey Club get together to virtually share a wee dram and get caught up on what's been going on. Ben's busy building a company that makes rocket launching pads. I'm not joking about that. And Spence, he spends his days as the top DJ in Alaska, getting kids and adults of all ages just moving their bodies. And you are invited to join us, but make sure you have a whiskey in hand when you tune in. That's next week on the Voyager's Podcast. Mahalo for listening, friends. <laughs>